Another question that comes up that most sophisticated investors will, will ask, kind of what I always ask is like, how are you guys making money? Why are you guys doing this? Why would you pass on a deal to me, lowly investor? What's the catch? This is a story about a dude named Lane. And then one day he went and tried to rent them out. And then he became one of the best of me. Hey, simple passive cash flow listeners. Today we have George Newberry owner and CEO of AHP. A lot of you guys have been investing in that fund for the past couple of years. But he is going here to talk about a new business that he has created called Pre-REO. But, and we're also going to be talking a little bit about what's happening with AHP through the uh, pandemic. But yeah, welcome, George. This is, uh, what is your third time on the podcast? I think at least. I appreciate you having me back, uh, Lane. Hope, hope to continue uh a run of continued appearances. And uh, this is probably like the fourth time recorded because one of the times I forgot about pressing the record button, <laughs> but it looks like it's it's good. So we're good. <laughs> Glad to hear it. All right, George. So what is this uh, pre-REO? Um, maybe maybe start at the beginning, right? Because a lot of guys, you know, they may not be note investors. So what is a sure. pre-REO Absolutely. first, right? Start at the yeah, top. Absolutely. So pre-REO is a... And it's our term that we made up, but here's here's how we define it. A pre-REO is a first mortgage that is in default that is secured by a vacant property. And that property could be a house, could be a condo, could be a apartment building, hotel, whatever it is, uh, but those properties are vacant. So that's what we describe. So it's likely to become an REO, hence it's a, a pre-REO. Uh, and you know the reason we started this was because we often um, have, as an example, a first mortgage secured by a vacant home in, let's say, New York. And New York, it can easily take two to three years to foreclose, even if no one's fighting the foreclosure. It's just such a slow process. And, and if we have a vacant property that's out there, uh, it can uh, suffer from deterioration, from um, vandalism. People could break in. Someone has to cut the grass, which is us. Uh, shovel the snow. Neighbors can complain and say, hey, you know, the property, uh, kids broke in over the weekend. Uh, so then the city comes to us and you know make sure that we do the work. So we do that, but it is a cost. And there's and meanwhile we're having to pay for property taxes for uh, for insurance. So I always thought, how do we? This home is there, and in some cases they're rentable. In some cases, with some repairs, they could be rentable. How do we make this into a um, generate some revenue while we complete the foreclosure process? Uh, so that that's that was where the concept came from. So the you know a lot of people will go after that's just the regular REOs and again that's where somebody owns a home they get they fall behind on their mortgage and I guess maybe maybe explain to us like what 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 distinguishes just a regular REO and the pre sure sure so an REO happens if we have a, va- a mortgage secured by a vacant or occupied property and we go all the way through the foreclosure process then we will offer that. Uh, home as a REO. We now own it. It's real estate owned is the where the REO comes from. And that is offered. And that's typically REO is used when it's owned by a lender, a bank, um, AHP, any hedge fund. Uh, they always, if you buy notes, you're going to end up with REOs. But the pre-REO is, is, is trying to buy that note before it's gone all the way through the foreclosure process. And because it's vacant, trying to generate revenue uh, during that um, that interim process uh, while while it's being foreclosed upon, right? So once it hits foreclosure, then it's REO. Then I, I guess once it once the foreclosure is complete, then it's REO exactly. Okay. So we're before the foreclosure is completed, but it's already in default. So at what point, like, is the person late? They're late, or maybe is it like thirty or sixty days, and then before the the bank or the REO kind of says it's it's in foreclosure that's when yeah. it's in this kind of this bucket exactly most of the time um most of the banks won't start foreclosure till it's 60 days delinquent sometimes even 90 or 120 today with covid even later we'd expect uh but nevertheless it's it, it it's past that period and before the foreclosure uh is completed and in some states in new york ohio illinois indiana florida these states are just examples of judicial foreclosure states we have to go to court and go there you go and go to court and it's just a long slow process in all these in in your example here the blue states pennsylvania um these states it's just going to be slow and 
average I'd say is a year. And in some states, you know, it can be two or three years. And that's that time, you know, time is money sounds cliche, but it is, especially when you own a, a defaulted mortgage. And if you're going to recover, if you're going to make $10,000 from this asset and you hold it for two years and you have to pay a couple thousand in taxes and insurance, you know, that, that will erode your returns. But if you were to collect $500 a month or $1,000 a month in rent uh, in the, over those two years, that would offset those costs and sometimes even allow you to, to make money during the foreclosure, while the foreclosure process is ongoing. What percentage of pre-REO inventory is from judicial states where judicial is harder for the bank to collect, it's more painful for them? The vast majority. Uh, you'll see, you know, most lenders uh, and, and funds like AHP are going to think, okay, well, in California, in normal times, pre-COVID, I can foreclose in six months. In Texas, in most cases, I can foreclose in 60 days or even less. So in those cases, why would I want to go through the extra step of appointing a receiver and collecting rent when the foreclosure will take about the same amount of time? And that's absolutely right. Now today, w- during COVID, it's California foreclosures on hold. Many of the states across the country foreclosures on hold. In some cases, even if it's a vacant property. Uh, and so you're just stuck. But in normal times, it's really uh, much more appropriate for judicial states. And you'll see, you had a map a moment ago. And if you go to the Priori website, it has a, a map which includes the entire country. And you'll see that there's a whole bunch of dots in the uh, in the judicial foreclosure states. And then you go out west, and it becomes uh, the concentrations become a lot less. Yeah. So. We, if you guys are looking at the YouTube channel, uh, I have the map up of judicial and non-judicial states. Uh, most of us are on the West Coast, so Washington, Oregon, California are non-judicial states. So it's it doesn't have to go to that strenuous process in the courts that we were talking about. But I think you have to overlay the political nature, right? Those are typically bluer states, so it is a lot more um, tenant friendly or. Um, Tenant friendly. and homeowner friendly, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. So it's not really, it's a Republican state or a uh, Democratic state, nothing really to do with that. It's just, I don't know, it's kind of random, right? <laughs> it is kind of ra- It is kind of random. I mean, what, East Coast, there's more judicial states as you get to the West Coast. You know, west of the Mississippi, many more the, many more are non-judicial states, yeah. and it, it, it's a patchwork. I think it's, this is a good example of, um, you know, who cares about politics? It is what it is. It's judicial or non-judicial. That's all we care Absolutely as right. investors. And I was excited to see that Hawaii, for some strange reason, is a judicial state. And this is That's where right. I got this crazy idea. And every time you see a Hawaii property, you kind of ping me and you're like, what about this one? Yeah. Um, yeah. So even there are a couple of, I mean, I'm pre a couple of lenders have listed assets in, in Hawaii, which... Uh, over the years, AHP's bought a handful of loans in Hawaii. It's not been a big market for us. And I'll tell you, it is a slow, expensive foreclosure process in Hawaii. Uh, so for those of you Hawaii investors, with all the distress that's coming up, yeah, there you go, the couple in Hawaii. It is something where lenders see, oh, it's going to take me a while to get a foreclosure complete in Hawaii. And, and that's when you get a foreclosure attorney in Hawaii, sometimes the attorneys you know, have to pay them to fly between the different islands. So it becomes expensive and a, and, and a hassle. The way I thought about using this is that this is nice because, you know, I'm not big into like being a Burr investor or, or being a remote investor unless you have a JV partner kind of doing your, you know, skin in the game, working on your behalf. You always want to have go into a deal where you have some kind of advantage. And in this case, you want to go in with you being able to do physical due diligence on the property and, you know, feel it, touch it, be around it. This is probably the only case where I advocate for being local to the property. So I, the way I thought about it, I mean, tell me some other good strategies, George, but the way I thought about it is like, this would be a cool way for me to actually buy my primary residence. Uh, I think a lot of people know that I, I'm very against renting or buying a home to live in. It's better to invest, especially if you live in a primary market like California, Washington, Hawaii, New York. But yeah, this would be a great way to pick up properties if I wanted to get more hands-on or maybe uh, somebody might drop a two, $4 million property I can get for a nice discount. Yeah, that's absolutely right. There are, um, there are some million dollar homes that are listed on the site. Those aren't owned by HP. Generally, they're owned by uh, other funds. Uh, and so there are other funds. So HP 2015 A plus is actually the owner of Priario. That's where this concept was, um, was conceived. And, uh, but now, we see the opportunity to market to other uh, other funds, and they're doing it. They're listing pro- properties, and we simply make a two thousand dollar fee for every 
property that's transacted on the site. Uh, and you're right, it could be appropriate for us, for future owner occupant, be, be, um, I'll, I'll let you know though, during that foreclosure period, a receiver can be appointed to rent it, uh, to repair it and rent it to a third party. They couldn't, um, the investor could not move in during that period. But once it goes REO, the foreclosure is complete, the, uh, the investor can direct whoever they want to sell it to. So it could be done that way. If you saw something you want to eventually live in, as long as you, you can allow some lead time, then that could be done. Yeah, so this is a great opportunity for like, you know, just one of our, our common characters of Simple Passive cash flow Group is, you know, you're a tech worker out in the Bay Area. You make over 200 grand a year. You're pretty busy. So you're, yeah, you're investing in passive investments like syndications um, after you've got in your taste and your fill of the turnkey rentals. And you're doing a little AHB, but you see a property like this and you might want to put in a bid. And is that kind of like the one of the avatars you're thinking, George, that this really will appeal towards? You know, some of this can be local to it. Yeah, it's definitely something where the local investor has the advantage. They can get better quotes on repairs. They can get better. Um, you know, we pay, we're in Chicago. Somebody says it's going to cost $2,000 to clean out you know, home, we don't know if that's good or bad price. I mean, we, you try to trust the people, but it's, you never know if they're taking advantage of the fact that, that we're foreign. When you're local and you can actually uh, work with trusted contractors and see the work that they're doing and make sure their bids are in line, the local person, without a doubt, has an advantage over AHP, over any bank or other hedge fund that is selling their assets here. And that's why they sell them, because a local can execute this strategy of doing repairs and renting it out during the foreclosure process, whereas we, um, you know, it's it's tough for us to do it uh, remotely. And you know, we've tried, so we get a lot of REOs here and there. We said if we only we're selling these things, you know, usually in in not great condition uh, to a local investor who then do some repairs and flip it to a home buyer who's paying top dollar because it's now a turnkey home that they can turn into uh, move into and get FHA financing or some other other. Um, affordable financing, it's always tough to execute that strategy remotely, or at least it's not area of expertise. The local guy always has the advantage. Local investor always has the advantage. And that's, I think, what we're trying to do with pre-REO is put these during the foreclosure process in the uh, under the control of a local investor. I think that's a, um, a big advantage. The way to do that is with this receivership. So you can't just, because you buy the note, you can't just go in and start fixing it up and renting it. You need to have a receiver, which is appointed by the court. So this is the step, you know, kind of the the first step is identifying one you want, buying it, and then uh, buying the note is what you're buying. And then you are working with a law firm to appoint a receiver, which could be a local real estate agent, a property manager, who can then work with you to do the renovations and rent the property during the foreclosure process. But you get a court order that allows you uh, to do that. Uh, you know, I'll step back. You were in a on the one on Pleasant Hill a moment ago in California. You know, some of these, that's a what I just described was a fairly active strategy um, in terms of uh, acquiring these, but there are some like Pleasant Hill. This one is currently on the market for, uh, this is a fix and flip deal where somebody it's took out a fix and flip loan, but they defaulted on the loan. Uh, but it looks like they've pretty much finished the property and now it's on the market for, I think it's in the 700,000 uh, range. And so here they're selling the, the mortgage holder, which isn't an AHP, is selling this mortgage. In all likelihood, uh, using this one as an example, that investor at some point is going to sell this for 700, 750, 800, whatever number they sell it for, and then simply pay off the loan. Now they lo they owe, they use it looking at these numbers. Yeah, the estimated value is 796, but the um, they owe uh, considerably, you have to log in to see the amount of the uh, debt. It's probably in the range of 650. So the Current owner sells it for 750. You get paid off at, at 650. You were um, you, know, you bought it for around 500. That that's uh, something the local investor is going to be better able to um, to understand those numbers, the nuances in terms of what that value is. But they it's something that would be a fairly passive strategy. And there's a few like this, and it's very easy to determine which they are. You simply take the addresses which are available uh, once you log in. And then you can go to Zillow and see which ones are currently for sale. There's even some that are under contract. And uh, that is a um, that is an interesting, it's in the, one of the Northern California ones, I think it was Pleasant Hill. But yeah, it's a good example in terms of what, um, that's Pasadena. Did so so another um, question that comes up that most sophisticated investors will, will ask, and this is kind of what I always ask, is like, how, uh -huh. how are you guys making money? Why are you guys doing this? Why would you pass on a deal to me? 
slowly investor? What's the catch? And I think if I'm sure. reading between the lines here, so AHP, the fund that George runs, uh, we, we'll talk a little bit about that at the end here, um, how that's going. AHP is more of a cash flow type of, they make money off cash flow. And some of these properties, like this one in, in particular, there's a lot of value there, but I think it doesn't really align with your guys' strategy of you know quick, quick small base hits. It's, this is going to take a while. It's, it might be painful. So it just doesn't fit the, the strike zone. It's not your guys' pitch, right? Is that? Yeah, that that's absolutely true. And we also have, we don't have money to buy every loan out there. And what we want to do is we came up with this concept originally for some 2015A plus loans, but then we thought, hey, this could work for others. And we started talking to other funds about it and they've started posting assets on there. We could simply make the $2,000 in the middle. And that's a, um, would be a good, um, you know, $2,000 doesn't sound that exciting, you know, on, on a one-off, but if you're selling, you know, we have one fund that's putting on, they're talking about putting on almost 90 properties uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, all across the country. So that it, it can become a business on its own uh, collecting these $2,000 fees, kind of like auction.com. I think they charge a $2,500 fee. So it's modeled very similar to that. We're simply getting a transaction fee on every note that's sold here. You know, good market, bad market. There's going to be an explosion in the amount of defaulted loans available over the next uh, next year. And it would be um, naive for us to think that AHP could buy them all. When I mean, or even some billion dollar hedge fund isn't going to buy them all. There's going to be billions and billions and billions of this stuff. AHP will certainly be continue to be a buyer. Uh, but I think our relationships with a lot of these hedge funds gives us the opportunity to market it to local investor who's going to be willing to pay more than we would and probably more than anybody because a local investor would be the person who would eventually buy it as an REO. So think about the usual trajectory, like we'll use this one in Pasadena, some hedge fund on Wall Street will buy this loan or currently owns this loan. They would uh, go through the process. You know, in, the, in California, foreclosure is on hold. So they're not going to be able to foreclose for could easily be a year or more. And uh, then they foreclose, they list it with a real estate agent and uh, they pay him or her a 6% commission and they pay other closing costs. And so, and in the meantime, that year, or maybe even more, they paid taxes and insurance. You know, this property could get broken into, squatter could move in, all kinds of things could happen. Why not get 75% of what, what they're going to get eventually, take it today. So they're going to get less, um, but they're going to get it now and then put this in the control of a local investor. And I think it's a compelling sale to, um, to different funds. And I think we're going to see a lot of assets put on the site as a result and a lot of invest a lot of funds are probably going to do better than they would if they held it to the ultimate disposition. And a lot of local investors are going to buy these things at less than they would buy them as REOs. So I think we're kind of, we want to become the marketplace uh, between those two parties. And you mentioned auction.com. I think a lot yep. of people are familiar with that, but they are foreclosed properties this pre foreclosure. Yep. So absolutely big difference. So auction.com. So, so we we're kind of following the business model, which is they make $2,500 an asset more or less. Uh, and, but they will, um, as a buyer's premium, they charge it to the buyer, just like we charge $2,000 to the buyer, but they, they usually only sell once it's com the foreclosure is completed and they're selling it as an REO. And so we're trying to do it early in the process uh, so that the lenders can exit early and the local investors can buy in earlier at a greater discount. Let's just kind of walk through this as a case study, George. Like, sure. I, I picked it because it's a million dollars and it just makes my life easy in terms of math. Why yep. make life harder? It looks like it's pretty nice inside. You know, who knows? Of course, there might be some things to fix up. Uh, so me as an investor, I see it on this site. I, and I'm like, oh yeah, this looks cool. You know, let me put in an offer or bid and, you know, pay my $2,000 program fee. Do I get access? I mean, obviously I'm going to go walk around the block, make sure this is not in the hood, but do I get access to the inside or? or Generally just, not. See in some cases they're already listed and there there's access that we can get, but most of the times, just like with any no purchase, you can only drive by, maybe get out of the car, look through the windows if it's vacant, uh, but you can't, you can't get inside. And so that's a risk that you're taking. Uh, you know, this one that luckily it was recently, it looks like it was recently refurbished. Again, this was a fix and flip loan that's gone bad, but it looks like a lot of the work has already been done to the home. But again, in many, most cases, we will not have access to the interior of the property. So that is a risk. Uh, but I think the discount uh, more than compensates for that uh, potential risk. Right. No risk, no reward. 
Yeah, so, that's always the case. Let's kind of walk through these the numbers here. You guys can check this out at simplepassivecashflow.com slash pre REO. How the money works, right? The sure. Compensation or the fee structure. So here's how we're uh, it works. Uh, big Wall Street funds typically don't want to sell to one local investor. They want to sell to counterparty that's been vetted and whatnot. So AHP falls in that category. Uh, so what we're doing is all these loans are being sold, even though they may be sold to 100 as an example, to 100 different investors, they are all sold into AHP. And then AHP provides participation interest to the local investors. And we will finance, at this point, we're financing at 75% of the, uh, of the purchase price and get a 12% return. And then the local investor puts up 25% of the, um, of the price. And that gives them the right to get earn everything um, over and above the 12% annual return uh, would go accrue to the investor. So they, all the upside goes to the local investor. We get a $2,000 program fee. We also get the servicing. So this, you almost every state requires that a licensed mortgage servicer services a loan, and these are loans. During the months before, or even in some cases years before it becomes REO, then it needs to be serviced by a servicer. So obviously, AHP servicing is more than happy to provide that service. We charge for pre areas. We just made it a flat $50 a month. So we would service. We also have an affiliated law firm, which is called Activist Legal, which uh, can handle nationally. They can uh, facilitate both the foreclosures and the receiverships uh, through a nationwide network of attorneys. So it's pretty turnkey. It's not like you're going to have to go to Oh, let me find a, an attorney who's going to understand how to do this. It's something that's fairly uh, unique. And uh, so we have attorneys that are familiar with, with, uh, with the process. Uh, so here's an example just to, to, to show how, how the money flows. Uh, let's say you purchase a note for $100,000 and a year later you sold it for one seventy-five. dollars Once it became REO, you had put some money into it. Now you sold it, you got one seventy-five. dollars So it was held out for a year. Here's how the money would flow. When it was first purchased, then the local investor would put up 25,000. That's 25% of the cost of the note. Uh, when uh, HP, or eventually it's gonna be pre REO, but right now it's HP, will put up 75,000, which is 75% of the cost of the note. The local investor would not only pay the 25,000, that's and the 20, they pay a $2,000 program fee at the outset. And then on a monthly basis, they pay the 12% return. So it's kind of now, like you guys are, you're kind of servicing like a lender, right? Like a kind of short term lender. Yep. Um, at 12%. Some investors might think, well, that's kind of high, but you know, hey, you guys, like, you got to think of like, look at the end here, the potential profit, right? I mean, every deal is different. Actually, but- yeah, build it into your process. Right now, eventually, I think we'll have that money available cheaper. We're trying to get another Wall Street fund to put up the money. Right now, HP is putting up the money to prove the concept, but eventually, some Wall Street fund will probably go in there and offer the money at nine or 10%, probably 9.9% or something like that. But I think you're right, absolutely right. When people make the bids, they they factor in the program fee of the two thousand, and they factor in the um, the cost of the capital, which in this case is twelve percent. Uh, you know, if, if that cost drops to nine percent, they'll probably be able to pay a little bit more. And if it were going to go up to fourteen percent, then they'd probably be willing to pay a little bit less. Uh, but in the end, if it sells for one hundred seventy five thousand, and they bought the note for a hundred, and they put in twenty five thousand in rehab. Two thousand dollar program fee, nine thousand dollars in um, um, in uh, lending inter- costs. Lending, lending costs. costs. Then they'd make set thirty nine thousand, which in a year is a pretty good return. Uh, and we'd get you know our nine our, our nine percent back. Plus we earned the two thousand uh, dollar program fee. Uh, so that that's the model uh, that we that we have, and I think uh, it serves a purpose in getting these vacant properties are. Without this, you know, there's a community benefit too. If any of you have lived next door to a vacant property, it's not the ideal neighbor. Probably the, la- the grass gets cut less frequently. The, um, you know, something bad happens to the property, gets broken into, there's a pipe burst or something like that. You know, there's, someone has to call it in, get in touch with the owner, come out and shut it off or do whatever needs to be done. So those are all things that uh, having an occupant in there, even if it's a tenant at this point, it's going to be better. Um, than having it sitting there vacant. So, and especially in some of the lower, low to moderate income areas where AHP works, it's definitely having an occupant is a huge advantage and benefit uh, to the neighbors and the community, in addition to the <clears throat> pre REO investor. For the uh, guys who are like, what's in it for me? I go to sleep there and all that stuff. And you can see it on the on the YouTube channel here. But yeah, it's kind of like, like, like a 2x equity multiplier in the sample. 
in what one year or so? Yeah, exactly. It's a significant return in a. Uh, it's a significant return now. It is at, in many cases. It's going to be active. This is something where you could do a lot of it from behind a desk, but you'd want to go out. I mean, I think your the advantage is realized when you go out to the property and just like any any of uh, your investors who've worked either. Uh, you know, owned apartment buildings or done fix and flip rehabs. It, it, there is some value to being right out there on the property and uh, and seeing what's going on, you know, on your own instead of relying on photos or, or reports from uh, from employees. But if you buy these near, it's easy to execute that and uh, and and you can be rewarded handsomely. And if you're just a like an accountant or a <clears throat> dentist, or you've never done construction work. Maybe you you screw up and you two times pay the rehab work where there's still prof probably profit for you if you screw up and you kind of run it like an amateur. I think that's the beauty of these things. And you have to learn, if you saw you really want to do it, then, I mean, just in anything, you do it, you screw up, you learn, how can I do better? And after a few times, you wait, now, now I'm doing pretty well. But uh, the first few times, uh, you know, you always end up probably paying a little bit more than you could and you figure out ways to, um, to improve on subsequent tries. So what happens if you if I click the button, I want to buy it. I send you guys the money, and then the guy in pre foreclosure actually pays. What's huh. what do we do? So yeah, no, the, the good uh, good question. So here's what happens. Uh, all these are offered. I shouldn't say we recommend to the sellers that they offer these either at seventy five percent of the REO value. So they think the REO is worth the hundred, sell it for seventy, offer it for seventy five thousand, or ninety percent of the debt of the total debt. So if uh, if only um, $80,000 is due on the note and it's worth 100, then offer it for 70, 72,000, I think that is. And so if the homeowner comes back in, you know, six months later and says, hey, I want to pay off my loan. I want I want my house, house back uh, or I won the lottery. I just inherited this money or whatever, however they, they came up with the money. They can do that, uh, but they're going to have to pay everything that's due on the note, which was $80,000 when you started, when you bought it in that example, plus the legal fees, additional interest, any monies that you've put into the property that were used for um, by the receiver to, to preserve the property. Uh, those are all recoverable. <clears throat> and so that's, so you would, let's say you ended up putting 20 into the property. So you would get the 80 that was due when you bought it for 72. You'd also get the 20 that you put in. And there's probably an additional interest of six months, which could be you know another few thousand dollars. Uh, so you would get all that. But that is something that is unlikely to happen because in, uh, in most cases, I mean, these are always or should always be vacant. And uh, as a result, so in most cases, the homeowners just just walked away. Now, there are some, like I pointed out, where the homeowner, where the property owner was an investor, apparently ran out of money for whatever reason, was unable to pay, but they're still trying to sell the property. And uh, so they'll either sell it for more than enough to pay off the loan, in which case you get paid off in full uh, and capturing that discount that was uh, made when you bought the loan. Or uh, you know they could come and say, hey, I want to do a short sale. So some of these are sold at, for considerably less than what the... Um, What's due on the note, but it's also because the property value is less. And then they could come and you could say, hey, I'll take the short sale, not take the short sale. Then it's up to you. Uh, but the, the homeowner still has property owner still has rights. They do, um, but they are served with the receivership and the foreclosure documents. And they can appear in court and say, hey, I want to do a, you know, I'm coming up with the money or whatnot. But if they don't show up and they default, then the process continues and they'd have to come back uh, at a later time and, and, uh, and have to come up with all the money that's due. Seems complicated, but... I mean, you got activist legal on your side as, and you'll be their client, probably. They kind of take care of all this and kind of just walk you through the timeline. I mean, and then Absolutely. Problems, problems come up, you just kind of work your way through it. Between the servicer, you'd always have a dedicated person at, the, at AHP servicing and a dedicated person at, H, at activist legal in order to, um, to answer your questions along the way. So if it sounds complicated, uh, maybe because it is, but it's actually a... Um, once you probably do it, I always, I'm always learned by doing, and we've done a few of these, uh, you know, as kind of a test, and so they, they worked well. So I think the um, learn by doing, and we're going to be there. We've done it, and we can uh, guide you every step of the way. It's like evictions. I mean, I don't really know how to do them. I know it as like a black box. Like I know what comes out the other end. I know how long it takes, but I don't really exactly know how to do one. But I have people to do it for me. <laughs> yep. Well, activist legal, just as a as a quick plug, they do evictions nationwide. They can certainly assist you no matter what state you're in. Yeah. So uh, yeah, if you guys need uh, eviction, let me know, and we'll connect you with the right folks. Uh, so let's switch gears a little bit, George. I mean, as we wrap up, you know, a lot of investors they've known about HP servicing 
for quite a while. I've invested with you guys since what, what, 2016-ish or something like that, 17. I got in the first fund at 12%. Now it's at 10% uh, paid monthly, which is cool. I mean, it pays my car payment. I don't know if I ever told you that. <laughs> yeah, I think, you, yeah, that's great. So how, how are things going through COVID? You know, I know like <laughs> from what I hear about all, a lot of my investors is like a few of them were trying to, you know, they had to rob, rob liquidity from certain places and one of the places they tried to get it from was AHP because you guys have a great liquidity type of um, caveat there. Yeah, what are you seeing from from your end? What are investors out there doing? If you can kind of make sense of the madness. Sure. No, good. I appreciate you bringing it up. So AHP, I mean, everybody had effects of COVID, and like you said, when when uh, COVID hit. We had uh, all-time record redemptions in March and then April. Those are the two two biggest months. It's now settled back down, but those redemption requests in March and April were very significant. And we heard from people who, hey, I need to pay payroll. Hey, I need to pay. Um, I need to cover a margin call. Uh, you know, my business is struggling. I need I need the money for assorted reasons. And we were um, and historically in, in our documents, it states that we will. Um, uh, Offer, we offer best efforts liquidity. So if you request the money, we're going to undertake our best efforts to um, return your investment within uh, 30 days. And historically, we've been able to do that. COVID hit, no longer able to do it. And we're still digging out from that uh, March, April demand. And, you know, I think in the last uh, last week or so, we uh, or the last week of the month, I think we returned about a quarter million dollars. So we are making progress on these, but it's incremental progress. And we're balancing, you know, we priority for us is to run the business. Number one. Uh, number two is to make our monthly distributions, which we haven't missed any and number, and we don't expect to. Uh, and number three is to, is to do these redemptions. Uh, so we can't, um, you know, you, if, if we were to satisfy all the redemptions, we didn't have any money for distributions. That would be obviously problematic for everybody. So we, we, I'm, I'm sorry. I, you know, it's unfortunate that people are waiting longer than they, than they wanted for their, um, for the redemptions, but it is something that you know we are expecting to get through, and, and expectations when COVID hit, you know, we say, oh, this is going to be sixty days or something like that, because at the time, you know, when COVID, we first had that first shutdown, everyone's saying, well, this is two weeks, uh, you know, shelter in place for two weeks, then this, is, then everything's back to normal. At least that was how I think people interpreted it, including us, because it was so early, and then, um, then it was extended and extended, and you know, now it's you know several months into this, going on five months into uh, the COVID era and things still aren't back to normal. In many cases, uh, there's foreclosure holds across the country. There's states where we have uh, foreclosed on properties in January of this year and we're still waiting on the deed. There are uh, situations where we foreclosed uh, and or we've gotten a deed in lieu, we can't complete an eviction. Uh, and so these are all kind of slowing our ability to, um, to move forward and, and realize gains uh, and, and, and revenue uh, that we would normally have accessible. Uh, so I think those are challenges. Also, in some cases, you know, sheriff's office closed, can't issue deeds, can a recorder closed or working from home, running behind, tough to record deeds in some situations. So it's a, it's a slow uh, process uh, that's getting better. Uh, but it is still uh, creating challenges. On the upside, I was a little bit nervous when when this all hit in terms of, you know, we had a lot of REOs, over 100, which is normal. You know, how does this impact? Are these prices going to, um, you know, is the value of our REOs, our notes going to have a significant impact? And post-COVID in the last, it's not post-COVID, it's mid-COVID, I guess, or it depends on your perspective. But in the last 30 or 40 day, days, our REOs, the ones that are out on the market, are um, selling better than pre-COVID prices, which is great. And uh, now, unfortunately, we still can't close them all because of assorted issues like county recorders or, or county offices being closed. But we're getting them under contract at, at, at very strong prices and our inventory is shrinking, uh, which is, I think, good for the moment because we are, um, we're capturing premium prices. Now, fast forward six months or a year and all these foreclosure holds go off. There's a uh, significant inventory coming out of the market. I would anticipate that the pricing should go down just based on normal, you know, normal economic cycles. However, with the low interest rates, I think that's kind of the wild card that keeps, uh, that's propping everything up uh, strongly. So it's hard to say what the future holds. And that's why if you're waiting on a redemption, they are in process. We are processing some every, every few weeks, but it is something where it's, uh, 
it's taking longer than expected and uh, hopefully that'll return to normal soon. I dug up the old info page, simplepassivecashflow.com slash AHP, but there's a little screenshot of like oh, my sure. activity back in this couple of years ago. I think 17. I withdraw, I, this is, I withdraw it at one point in 2018, 55 grand. And then I think I, yep. I replaced it later before the fund closed. Yeah. I mean, what's your mentality on how much percent cash reserves do you have in your, your fund? And what's it's, like the mentality of like, all right, when do you feel comfortable to go out and take some of that cash and buy more stuff? Well, we're coming? buying. I mean, we bought about $4 million worth of loans last week. Uh, and so we are actively buying loans. Again, the business uh, priority is running a successful business. That's going to be benefit all of our investors. Uh, so we did have a good opportunity last month. We're working on a few opportunities pools for this month. Uh, but there are opportunities that we're seeing that we are um, taking advantage of. So it's a balance of you know new acquisitions, having um, new acquisitions and, and operating a, a profitable business and then paying for distributions, which right now I'm guessing, I mean, this is just over the all the companies we probably have, I don't know the exact numbers, but we probably have 800,000 roughly in cash available right now uh, at this very moment. But you know we're doing distributions in a couple of days. That'll... Um, be a considerable amount that goes out, but you know there's new payments that come in, new REOs that say that sell uh, that sell. So there's always money coming in and, and money going out. But at any given time, we we do have a decent amount of cash on hand. I try to keep it as low as possible, just because that money we're paying investors on that money. So I'd like it to be invested. So it's a bit of a bouncing act, right? Because I mean the way it is, like it's a ten pref, right? So yeah. You want to keep it low so you can make some money, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the money sits in, uh, we're paying 10% on a million bucks that's sitting in in a bank account that's paying us at best 2%, then we are, um, you know, that's a negative negative 8%. So we want to keep that as little as low as possible. And I think we're, we've been doing that. I mean, as just as a point of reference, when I came in here a year ago, I came back into the CEO role. We had over $8 million in the bank. Not a good... Uh, not a good situation, uh, and so we're. I was able to invest that. It took a few months though, because a year ago the opportunities it was it was difficult to invest, and that's why if you remember a year ago we had stopped accepting new investments because we had a lot of money come in. It was difficult for prior management to um, find opportunities. And in fairness, it was when I came in, it was difficult to find good opportunities uh, myself. They were um, the market was very heated. In order to generate strong returns, we the, the offerings were few and far between. We were able to buy stuff uh, and, and deploy that money, but it took several months. Fast forward a year, the market's now, we see it opening up with these uh, with great opportunities. Uh, and we think that'll only increase over the next uh, next six months to a year. So we're getting we're taking the best ones we can find now and, and we'll continue to do that. So what's, um, I got into the 12% fund right now. The 10% fund is still open. Where, where, you, where do you think you're, is this all heading, right? Because the Fed fund rate is like in zero for the past six months. It's heading down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you guys are getting more popular, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the next, so HP servicing, this fund will close in, I believe it's uh, the first week in November. Uh, that'd be the last uh, investment that we can take. And, and it's, it's imposed by the SEC. We have two years to raise money. Uh, so that two-year period ends at the beginning of November. At that point, we will uh, close the HP servicing, no more 10%. We will have a new fund up then or sh hopefully shortly thereafter uh, that will offer um, a similar type of strategy. Uh, but we think the returns will be less. Uh, right now, it's, we're working on the, on the submission of the SEC. We think it'll be around 7%. And that sounds lower. It, well, it is lower, uh, but compared to what the, you know, the um, prime rate and, and the different uh, indexes are, it's still a very um, generous uh, spread. We've, 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 we've uh, toggled between should it be seven, should it be six, should it be eight? Uh, I think in the end, it, it'll be seven, but it could, could end up, uh, we decide a little bit lower, a little bit higher. Uh, but right now, I'd say seven. Yeah. And so the challenge is out there for you guys. I'll give you a hundred bucks if you can find me something better that pays uh, a better rate of return that has a better risk profile and with the liquidity that's the big thing here the ability to click this little redeem button and pull out <laughs> some money whenever you want so there you go there you go bounty hunters out there let me know <laughs> anything else you think we missed george no, I think we covered a lot of ground. Uh, hopefully, that's uh, hopefully it was helpful to your audience, and they'd be interested either in Preario or, or or kept updated or interested for the first time maybe in HP. Uh, certainly, reach out to us. Uh, we're here to help and answer any questions. 
uh, there's there's my book. Burn Zones. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's me when I was probably like 20 years old, uh, racing in Arizona. Uh, that was a race. Uh, if anyone knows Arizona, it was it was called Yuma Blythe Yuma. So it started in Yuma, Arizona. The race went up to Blythe. California and back down to Yuma. Uh, it was about 200 miles. And as you can see, it was fairly uh, hot what, in the desert. What is that one called? I don't know if they do it anymore, but it was Yuma, Blythe, Yuma. So it's just okay. the three city, the well, two cities, the three city names, uh, one after another. It's 200 the, plus mile bike race. Not the David Goggins, the one he did in his book. One of I don't those, know. I don't like in de through Death Valley or something like that. Yeah, it's not like it's not was not in Death Valley, but it's certainly uh, the terrain was probably pretty close. Right. There is a uh, you may be thinking there's a, a running race across Death Valley, Badwater, which is uh, yeah. pretty, pretty awesome. That's I've never done thinking. that. But that does sound like a lot of fun. Well, it does sound like quite a challenge, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> Let me catch myself up fun. So if you guys want to learn more about HP, go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash HP. And if you guys are interested in playing around with pre-REO, go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash pre-REO. And uh, we did a little tutorial video going through the website uh, earlier for you guys. And you guys can kind of digest these numbers and how it all works. Uh, but yeah, great way for you know passive investors if you want to kind of invest from your desk you know, and, and do a little white glove investing. Um, this is a way to, to do it. If not, a lot of other passive investing ways, turnkey rentals to start off, and then of course, syndications and private placements. Appreciate it, George. Thanks for oh, joining thanks. us, man. Thanks, Lane. Always appreciate it. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.